Well, it's a beautiful Sunday morning. Welcome to Petaluma Christian Church. It's so nice to see all the smiling faces, and it's good to be in God's house this morning. I saw some new faces today. I want to welcome uh, Reuben and Luke, and if you have a chance, when before you leave today, say hello to Reuben and Luke. All right. By a show of hands, how many have had a great week? All right. All right. Thank you, Lord. If you're plagued by distractions like I am, um, it's nice to come to the house of the Lord and not be distracted. Simple things like, like losing the screw in your glasses so that you have to put a little safety pin in there, you know, until I see the, the eye doctor tomorrow and have that fixed, but in the meantime, I can't go like this for the fear of the glasses falling off, and you know, so it's simple little distractions like that that sometimes just takes you away from what you should be focused on, right? And today, we're focused on Jesus. We're focused on being here and seeing the family of God, welcoming new um, people to our congregation, and thanking God for everything that he's done. So let us pray. Father, thank you so much, and welcome to our new folks. And Lord, welcome, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here all the time. And Father, that you may work in our lives on a daily basis. Thank you for the word that we're about to hear today. Thank you for the messenger that's delivering that word. Bless his life. Bless the words, Lord. We praise you and thank you. Pray that our hearts and minds be open to the worship today. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you can you. stand with me. Come, the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my Thank you, Lord, for pursuing us. Uh, we can love because you first loved us. So we thank you that um, uh, as we've wandered, like all sheep do, uh, pursuing our own passions and pleasures, our own interests, um, even sometimes unconsciously, we just are, tend to wander. We thank you, Jesus, for bringing us back. We thank you for uh, friendships where people remind us about you. Um, 
to bring us back. We thank you for um, community. We thank you for Sunday mornings where just another reminder to return to you, Jesus, and, and find true life and true joy in you. Uh, we pray that we continue to, to grow and to flourish in that life this morning and um, help us listen to you and to your words we do in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can have a, a seat. Um, grateful this morning for uh, each of you. Uh, it's really hard to follow Tony um, up here. I, I love stand-up comedy, but anytime someone kills like Tony did, uh, you just have no chance. So I'll, I won't say much. Other than this, uh, I'm, I'm grateful um, yesterday for our uh, Helping Without Hurting seminar, all who attended that. We're excited to be thinking as a church uh, how we can really serve our city well in a way that empowers people in need, uh, empowers people who are broken just like we are. It just looks different for different people. Um, so we're excited um, to be doing that. So just keep praying for us as a church. I'm still in my first, I'm not even three months in, so I'm still trying to learn about us as a church, learn about you guys, build relationships, but also get to know our culture and uh, figure out how do we can best serve the city. So keep, keep praying to that end. I know there's such a heart here from you guys to really love the city for Jesus and so appreciative of that. Um, so uh, every once in a while, uh, it is good for me to uh, recharge my mental creative batteries and it's very good for you to hear from a different voice other than me. And so this morning, I'm grateful that we could hear from a different voice, whom, a guy who I love a lot. Uh, Kelly Graham, he's a good friend of mine, uh, planning a church here in Petaluma uh, coming up this year, hopefully in April, uh, Emmanuel Church. I'm so grateful for him and his family. Hunter, Sage, Silas, and Carissa are here with us as well, um, and he's going to be preaching for us this morning. I'm going to welcome Kelly for, come on up, Kelly. Here he is. Give him a big hand. Yes. <laughs> Great for this brother. Uh, I, I, I've kind of as I've gotten to just know most people, but I've uh, already had a great connection with him, especially. Um, he's a dear guy. Uh, he, he really loves the Lord. He's all about planting a church that has really strong emotional health and really uh, loves people in the city well. And I'm so grateful for his family being here as well. And so I'm just going to pray for him, and he's going to uh, kind of guide us in God's word this morning. So uh, pray with me if you would. Father, thanks so much for my, my brother Kelly. Um, thank you especially for his heart for you. Father, thanks for his heart to see um, people flourish in Jesus, in your son Jesus. Um, I'm grateful for uh, a brother like that. Um, we just ask um, your blessing on him this morning as he preaches to us. May your word come to us clearly. May we receive it well. Please prepare our hearts. We also want to pray your blessing on him uh, going forward. Um, the harvest is plentiful here in Petaluma, especially on the west side. Um, Father, I think thankful for a partnership and ask that you would um, bless him and his family uh, with others to, to plant with. And uh, we just ask that you would guide him all along the way. Please, Lord Jesus. We ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Church, Petaluma Christian Church, it is so good to meet you. And as, I've, as you've already heard, my name is Kelly Graham. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for the kind introduction. And thank you for the worship leaders this morning. I, I've led worship for 21 years prior to today. Uh, and so it means a lot to me to come here and be led by other people and to see it done well. And for just the service, I don't take that for granted. I did it for so long. Uh, now, before we get started with the most important part of what I'm going to say this morning, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my family because I think this is fun. We arrived in Petaluma from Charleston, South Carolina about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and I'm planting a manual church, as you just heard. My wife's name is Carissa, and we've been married for going on 17 years. And so, um, Carissa, we met when she moved to Charleston, uh, because she is a native of Petaluma, believe it or not. And she went to VBS at this very church, which I think is <laughs> super fun that now her, her husband's now preaching here today. So that's super neat. Um, 
And as long as we've been married, we've been visiting Petaluma, and we've had a heart for this city. And so uh, now, after all these years, the Lord has called us here. And I'm so thankful to know that we have like-minded brothers and sisters here at PCC that, uh, that we can reach this area with the gospel together. Uh, and I look forward to serving side by side with you in the kingdom for years to come. Now, I'm going to share with you a little story about my childhood to get us started, and then we'll get into the sermon text. But uh, when I was a little boy, my family would eat beef stew a lot. You know, we were not a well-to-do family, and beef stew was pretty cheap. You could just stick beef and potatoes and carrots in a crock pot, and out comes this slop we call beef stew. And my family would ser- serve that beef stew over a piece of Merida white bread. I hated that meal. I didn't like it at all. Uh, I didn't want to eat it, particularly the cooked carrots. To this day, I can eat raw carrots all day, but cooked carrots just they gross me out. Uh, anyways, one day my dad brought home uh, for my family a box of chocolate-covered bananas on a stick, which is kind of a weird dessert, but that's what he did. And he never did that. And when you don't have dessert often, the thought of frozen chocolate-covered bananas on a stick sent my mind into the childlike grandeur only surpassed by Christmas Eve. And just like a lot of children, it took me forever to eat my beef stew, and everyone left the table. But before my dad left, he said what any good dad would say, and he said, you can't have the chocolate banana unless you eat all your food first. So, uh, 15 minutes went by, and I... You know, I I saw the beef stew becoming more disgusting. It was cold, it was solidifying. And so I peeked down the hall one direction, and then I looked down the other direction into the den, and nobody was there, so I disposed of my uh, beef stew in the trash can. Then I went and told my parents I was finished, and they put the banana in front of me, and they walked away. And I saw that beautiful chocolate-covered banana on a stick, And I had this Edgar Allan Poe moment where in my mind the floorboards were creaking. You know, I could hear the beef stew mooing its disapproval from the trash can. And the grief of my childhood lies sent me crying down the hallway into my dad's arms where I told him all that I had done. And to my surprise, he gave me a hug and he told me he was proud of me for telling the truth. I still expected to get sent to my room or for my dad to take some leftovers and pop them back on some white bread. And in many days, he may have done that. But this time, he took me into the kitchen. He sat me down, asked if I'd learned my lesson, and he gave me the banana. Now, my dad didn't have to do that. There were other times when he was forgiving, but I still had to pay the consequences for my wrongdoing. But I can't forget how kind my dad was to me that day. And today we're going to talk about how God is a lot like that. When we confess our sin, God doesn't just let us off the hook. Instead, he entered our world. He pays the consequences of our sin himself, and he walks through our suffering with us. Now, I'm going to read Psalm 6. These are the most important words you're going to hear today because they are the inspired words of God. What I'm going to say is not, but hopefully it will help you understand these inspired words better. So I'm going to read from Psalm 6. Now, if you're not familiar with Psalms is, just go to the middle of your Bible, go just slightly left. It's a big book. You'll probably run into it. Psalm 6. I'll read this aloud. Hear the word of the Lord. To the choir master with stringed instruments, according to the Sheminith, a Psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord. Deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. 
Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. It speaks truth to us in a way that nothing else in the world speaks truth. Lord, we are here in everything that we do, singing songs and hearing your, from your word. Everything wraps itself around this revelation that you gave us in the Bible. So I pray that you'd help me to preach it, uh, preach it well today, to be faithful to the text. And I pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, leave none of us untouched so that we can be changed and grow in holiness and grow in your likeness. I love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So I'm going to give you a little bit of educational background on this psalm because I think that's important for understanding the psalms. We know that from the top of the, uh, of the psalm where the notes are that this psalm was written by King David. And we don't know the specific situation that he's praying about. But it could have been in reference to his argument with his son Absalom, uh, which put David in a pretty scary situation. But the main thing you need to know, despite whatever he's praying about that's kind of unknown here, the main thing you need to know is that the trouble David is praying about in Psalm 6 is the result of his own actions. And he's asking God for mercy. That's why this psalm is included in a list of seven penitential psalms where there's an expression of penance or repentance or turning from sinful actions and behaviors and then turning toward God and his ways. And as far as the structure of Psalm 6, you may not realize this, but all psalms have some sort of poetic structure. They're poetry. They're poetry meant for instruction and they're poetry meant for relating to a God. They're models for us as believers for praying to a holy God who created us. And there are three simple poetic movements to this psalm. Number one is a plea for God's mercy and help. That's verses one through five. Then there's a recounting of David's grief over his sin and his circumstances in verses 6 and 7. And then, there's, lastly, there's an expression of confidence in God in verses 8 through 10. And I'd like to draw your attention to a biblical truth that acts kind of as a, I like to give this to people because it's a good way of just kind of giving a thesis statement for what this psalm is about. And then we'll zoom in on the text from here. But our biblical truth, the main point you need to take away from what we're going to be learning today is this. God graciously forgives us and helps us even when our own sins cause our circumstances. Do you hear that? God graciously forgives us and helps us even when our own sins cause our circumstances. Amen? That's a pretty important truth, church. You and I, we collectively have the privilege of speaking to the holy God. And he doesn't guilt us over our sins. So let's start with the first movement of the psalm, and then we're going to walk our way through. I'm going to reread, because it's such a short text, verses 1 through 5. This is the first movement of the psalm. And I'm going to uh, read from this text right now, verses 1 through 5, where you can see it on the screen here as well. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O oh Lord, for my bones are troubled." My soul is also greatly troubled, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Turn, O oh Lord, deliver my life, save me for the sake of your steadfast love, for in death there is no remembrance of you, in Sheol, who will give you praise? So based on that, based on David's writing right there, what's our first supporting truth? Number one, when you confess your sins, be honest knowing that God is gracious. When you confess your sins, be honest, knowing that God is gracious. Right out the barrel, we see David's honesty. He knows what he's done wrong, and, and he knows that God hates sin. And in a healthy understanding of God's fearfulness and God's love, David begs God for mercy. He says, O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger. Don't discipline me in your wrath. 
Be gracious to me, he begs. How can we, as individuals and as a church, model David's honesty? I'll give you three ways, and I want to tell you, don't try to work on all of these ways at once, you'll get weary. If you find something in here that speaks to the way that you struggle in your prayer and your repentance, write that down and allow, it to, to allow yourself to work on it for a bit. So here's number one, A, let's say A, be honest about your sin. Be honest about your sin. David didn't ask God to condone his sin. He, instead, he confessed, he turned from it, and he asked God for mercy. So when I, when I read that, when we have found that we have sinned, is that our reaction? Do we only fear the consequences of our sin, or do we fear God himself? That's a good question to ask ourselves when we reflect. The answer to that question is very telling about our own hearts. Do we have a respect for God's power against sin and his hatred of it? David did. And this psalm is a model of repentance for us all. But David didn't only fear God. He knew God's deep love for him too. So there's a second thing we can learn to to be honest about like David was. B, be honest about your need. David confesses that he's languishing in his guilt and the consequences of his sin. And then, this is what David prayed. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones and my soul are troubled. Heal me. My bones and my soul are troubled. He needed healing. David knew he needed healing, and he knew God could provide it. A little note on that. Isn't it true that when we're weighed down by guilt, that not only our soul is troubled, but even our bodies respond? God cares for every facet of your life, both spiritual and physiological, so you can freely ask him to meet your needs. We've all felt the uncomfortable consequences of our sins in our spirit and in our bodies. For example, when you made that mistake for the hundredth time that you said you'd never make again. Do you remember how you felt? Or when you've injured your relationship with a beloved friend or a family member. How many times have I done that? And when we've sinned in a way that we thought no one would know and then everyone finds out more people are hurt than you ever intended. Or when you feel the guilt over your actions so much that it feels like you cannot live another day. So we look for the closest thing to dull our senses, like food or alcohol or inappropriate relationships. And when we turn to these things and not to Jesus... We're trying to find an anesthetic to dull our pain instead of asking God to heal us. Rather, ask God to help and lean into the church community. God will eventually grant us what we need, especially when we're honest with him about how much we need him. But in those difficult times where it's just we just find ourselves waiting And we don't understand why God doesn't just step in. That's why David shows us that he gives us permission to pray with frankness. David cries, but you, O Lord, how long? So be honest about your sin. Be honest about your need. Be honest about your emotions. Did you know that you could say the words, Oh Lord, how long? And he receives it. He may not respond for some time yet, but he's not offended by the exasperated sigh, How long, oh Lord? God knows your discontent, and he knows your confusion. He wants you to express it to him as David did. And I'd recommend respecting it, or I'd recommend expressing it respectfully. But by all means, express your distress and bewilderment to God. He cares deeply about it. So, when you confess your sins, be honest knowing that God is gracious. 
And one part of David's request here, just to kind of back up a little bit, shows his understanding of God's grace. He prays that God would save him for the sake of his steadfast love in verse 4. So David doesn't appeal to God on behalf of David's own good merit. He appeals to God on behalf of God's love for him. David knows what the, 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 that he caused his own problem here, and he knows God still gives grace for his need because God is loving. Now let's read the second movement of the psalm, and we'll move on from there. This is verses 6 and 7 in Psalm 6. This is a very emotional passage. I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eyes, my eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. So based on that, in the second movement of the psalm, what's our next supporting truth? Number two, when you confess your sins, God cares deeply about your repentance. Why else would God allow this stanza about weeping and heartbrokenness in Psalm 6? Why would he allow this, this stanza in here? It's a model of prayer for us. How does Psalm 6 show us that God cares about our repentance? Well, we can see that A, God cares deeply about your sorrow over sin. And I've already said to be honest with God, so we're not going to linger here for long, but the reason you can be honest is that God cares deeply about how you respond to your wrongdoing, so tell him about it. God, or David wasn't manipulating God with crocodile tears just peeking through his fingers, wondering if he was fooling God with some display of emotion. No, David... David was writing about his deep and real emotional responses to sin. He was repentant. He was remorseful, ready to turn from evil. And God cared. And how else do we know that God cares about our repentance? We'll sit here for a little bit. Because B, God cares deeply about the circumstances that followed your sin. It's not something we think about very often, is it? We often just think, well, this is the consequence I pay, right? No. David's crying and his grief were over his sin and the consequences that followed. That's why David says his weeping is because of all my foes. His own sin stirred up his enemies against him. And this truth has big implications. The beauty of the Psalms is that they don't just address the quote-unquote theological issues like sin. Sometimes we like to treat it as a reference book that helps us know how to deal with things. But instead, the Psalms acknowledge the place where theology intersects with human experience. This is the beauty of the Psalms. This is David's heart cry. This is his real, actual experiences he's talking about. So God even cares about the circumstances caused by our sins, not just our sins. So we can lay our circumstances before God, knowing that he will come to our aid. Now, when, when I've gotten into an argument with my wonderful wife, Carissa, <laughs> because of my own sinful actions, I have cried over that sin, and I have hated the discord that I found in our relationship when I do these things. And this psalm gives me confidence that God has compassion on me and in the circumstances I find myself in. Now, here's an important truth. And if what I'm about to say to you is not a comfort to you, I suggest you meditate on it for a little bit. Because we can cry and we can lament, and we can weep over our sin and circumstances until our bed is flooded with tears like David's, and we can tell God how languished we are, and the God of all creation walks right into your sorrows with you. How could this be? How can he, possibly, the transcendent God, walk through my sorrows with me, how can he care? I'll tell you why. 
Because God the Son became a man and he walked the sin-filled earth to be tested and put through the ringer of human experience. And he experienced more than we ever have because he did not give in to sin like we did. He felt the full weight of sin's, uh, of sin's resistance and he prevailed, remaining sinless. And not only did he succeed in living a life that was completely, uh, completely uh, clean from sin, he can now relate to us on a heart level because of his experience. This is why we can confess our sins with tears before the God of all creation and know that he cares. I'll tell you why. Because he himself cried at the death of his friend Lazarus. How else can we know that God is not detached and heartless toward us in our sin? I'll give you a few reasons. Because he himself was afflicted and affected emotionally by the wages of sin, even though he had never sinned once. Because he himself was ridiculed and doubted and accused of things he never did, and yet he forgave his wrongdoers. Because he himself was betrayed and abandoned by his closest friends and remained their friend, even exalting them in history. Why can we have confidence that the God of all creation understands and cares about our confessions and our condition? Because he himself, as the book of Isaiah says, was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men would hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one from his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Church, Jesus experienced more than we've ever experienced. And more. <laughs> By becoming sin on the cross. He's not a detached God as we so often think. Yes, he is infinitely holy and he is transcendent, but he is also intimately close to us now by his Holy Spirit, which he gave at Pentecost, and who indwells his people. He comforts us because Jesus went before us and he goes through our experiences with us. Jesus cares about our grief and the impact our grief has on our mind, our soul, our body, and our emotions. So church, bring your sin and your sorrows and the consequences of your sin to Jesus. Now, <laughs> let's read the last movement of the psalm because this is a very different movement than the other two. This is verses 8 through 10. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord heard, has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. My enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. So what can we gain from this? Our final supporting truth is this. Number three. When you confess your sins, you can be confident that God will forgive. Amen. Did you hear David's response after his plea for mercy and after the recounting of his grief in the first two movements? He says, depart from me, you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. And based on David's own life, the historical David, he knows God's history of 
patience and compassion and his unfailing response to David's own prayers. And so David declares, the Lord accepts my prayer in verse 9. And David presumes on God's hatred of evil. And with assurance, he states that his enemies shall be greatly ashamed and troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. He says it with confidence because David knows God will respond. David knows that God has forgiven him. And David knows that God will come to his defense because he's asked for mercy. And did you know, church, that when you confess your sin, God will forgive you? There's not a question in mind. When we ask for forgiveness, God forgives. And did you know that when you sin, God has already paid the ultimate consequences of your sin 2,000 years ago on the cross of Jesus Christ? Church, this is the good news. Forgiveness is ours. We have peace between us and the creator God. Our prayers are now heard. We were God's enemies. We were evildoers. But when you put your trust in him with your life, you are transformed by his mighty power and brought into the life-giving presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Behold, the good news Of the gospel. This is what David himself was looking forward to with his entire life. David looks at the history of God's faithfulness to him and to Israel, and he is so certain of God's forgiveness and continued care that he even confesses it before others, before his opponents. So I ask you the logical question. Have you, have I, been so confident in the Lord's character that we've been talking about today that you would be willing to confess it before others? I'm not talking about a social media post. I'm talking about in your real relationships, in the time that you have with others who do not know Jesus Christ, are you willing to put it out there that you believe in forgiveness and in the gospel of Jesus Christ? David was given covenant promises by God. And David was standing on those promises. And if you are a Christian here today, Did you know that God has made so many covenant promises to you? God has promised us justification before God. In other words, a reconciled relationship with our creator that we broke. You sinned, I've sinned, and Jesus died on the cross to pay for that sin. Jesus took our death for us on a cross, and he was pierced through his hands and his feet and from his side, spilling out his blood. And if you've been in the community of the church long, you'll know that we sing songs about that blood because his blood was pure and innocent, and it flowed through the veins of a man who never once sinned, which means Jesus is the only one who is qualified to die in our place. The covenant promise God gives to you and to me and to the church as a whole is eternal life. Life lived in God's very presence, the life giver and forgiveness and power over sin and grace to cover the sin that remains. He even promised you his presence through your earthly suffering, not freedom from suffering, do not make that mistake, but his comforting presence is promised to you throughout your suffering. There are two great evidences that you understand and believe with your whole heart that God has forgiven you of your sin. Number one, It's your willingness to turn from sin. And number two, your willingness to confess trust in God before others like David did. At risk of ridicule, at risk of rejection, at risk of suffering. Because if we believe, we will confess our beliefs before others. Why? I'll tell you why. 
because Christ is worthy. God graciously forgives us and helps us even when our own sins cause our circumstances. So run into your father's arms as I did to my earthly father and he will receive you with love and grace. If you want to know more about this forgiveness and having relationship with God, if you have not experienced this yourself, take Ryan aside, take me aside, take whoever brought you aside and ask them about it. Don't be afraid to do it. And I'll just say one more thing before we finish up. Because this is a, a really interesting truth that when you look at Psalm 6, you can see very clearly. Do you see at the end of the psalm, Psalm 10, or verse 10, in in Psalm 6, David says that his enemies will be troubled. At the beginning of the psalm, David says his own body and his soul are troubled. After he has confessed his sin, and he takes his plea before God, and proclaims confidence that God's promise to forgive is real, It's no longer his own bones and soul that are troubled. It's his enemies. This is the great reversal of our hearts and our lives when we confess our sins before God. So can I encourage you to bring your sins, bring your sorrow, and bring the consequences of your sin and lay them at the feet of Jesus The truth of the gospel instills confidence in God. Trust in Christ enough to confess your sins because Christ is worthy. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for so much hope. Psalm 6 at face value looks like such a depressing subject because David has sinned and he's weeping and he's confessing. But God, when we look at this in light of the gospel, we can see that there is so much hope here. That we can bring all of our sins and our sorrows before you and you care. And you have paid for the consequences. You have paid for the sins of your people. And that gives me so much confidence to turn from sin and to confess you before others. To help us to be faithful people faithful ministers of the gospel because each one of us are entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So help us to be faithful with it and help us to believe it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You can stand with me.
temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay
Amen. Morning, everybody. You may be seated. Hello. Todd is back. And I want to say thank you to everyone who prayed for me. For those of you that are new, don't understand or don't know, uh, I was out doing my normal bicycling and trying to stay in shape, and no good deed goes unpunished. So I was involved in a little off-road experience, which was unplanned, and had a compression fracture, which isn't fun. I don't recommend it. Uh, and along with that went a bunch of sciatic pain, which I certainly don't recommend, nor have I ever experienced it. But now I can say I've had it, so let's hope it's a one-and-done thing. But anyway, thanks to your prayers and a few of my own, uh, I'm back and I'm feeling very good. So thank you for that. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm, uh, I guess in a way, unfortunately, very acquainted with prayer because in my life I've been involved in a lot of accidents and a lot of physical uh, breakage, so to speak. Uh, but praise the Lord, he's been there with me, and my, my angels, uh, my guardian angels probably work overtime. He may have had to assign three or four of them to me, uh, you know, but I appreciate that because uh, they definitely have kept me safe. So thank you all for that. Sorry to belabor that point. Um, so if you look under, for those of you who are new here or for those of you that have forgotten, uh, this is underneath your seat, and this is our contact card, so we would very much appreciate those that are new to fill this out, or if you have never filled it out, please do so. And that way uh, we can get back to you. Also, it allows us to uh, monitor your prayer requests. So if you're a member here or if you're here and you have a prayer request, jot it down on this and we will get it. So jot that out and place it on your seat when you leave, and we'll be uh, picking those up after service. Uh, so run to the phone. A necessity in our modern world. Um, so, uh, let's see, it's going to be next Saturday, October 9th at 10 a.m. here in the main sanctuary. Shelby and Linda Dunlap are going to, are inviting you to come and join them for the celebration of life for Michael Dunlap, uh, their departed brother, and a tire is casual, so keep that in mind. Uh, we are also holding a blood drive here on the 31st, which would be Halloween, how appropriate, right? Uh, I think if you read the flyer, I think if you read the flyer, they're actually going to give T-shirts out, too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway, if you have a, if you want more information, on it, there's flyers in the foyer, and then you can also contact Keith, and I think Keith's the one that spearheaded this, so thank you for doing that, Keith. That's an outstanding job. Uh, for everything else, go to the website. The website is new and improved and awesome, thanks to Ryan. Uh, and that's, for those of watching on the Internet, that's at um, petalumachurch.net, all one word. So go there and check that out. And I'm going to pray for the Church of the Week, which is the Salvation Army. And we'll turn it over to Ryan. So if you bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for the work of the Salvation Army and the things they do for not just us in this community, but for our nation. And we just pray that you would strengthen their organization and that it would do your work. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, one quick note on, thank, thank you, Todd. It is great having you back, and we're grateful for all those angels taking care of you. Uh, and, and for your, your leaping ability to miss some of the driveways along the way. All but one. All but one. <laughs> all but one. Uh, yeah, so uh, just a quick note on uh, Shelby uh, and Linda's brother, uh, Michael, and his um, celebration of life. It said 10, to, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. up there. It's not going to be five hours uh, total, that's the time they have the building for. So uh, do come. I know they, they would love to have you guys. They've um, loved their brother Michael, and he served the Lord so graciously through Youth with a Mission and uh, other organizations. Um, his is a really neat story of trusting Christ and being transferred from death to life. And um, I think you'll really benefit from coming and, of course, supporting Shelby and Linda and their family as well. Not from 10 to 3. Don't feel like it's that obligation. Probably less than an hour. Less than an hour uh, and there's going to be cornhole afterwards, so I know that. Uh, just to enjoy. And food as well. Uh, more importantly, I don't know. About the same. All right. Um, so we have a great opportunity this morning to um, celebrate the Lord's Supper together. I'm going to read from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. 
where Paul said this, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we've been going through this uh, series, and of course, take a break today through the book of Acts, and um, talking, for example, recently about being sent to win hearts, um, for example, and the continual uh, challenge to be sent into the world to share the good news about Jesus in word and deed. We're also reminded on Sunday mornings we get to hear the good news through the preached word, uh, but also uh, we get to uh, preach the good news to one another as each of us partakes of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we proclaim Christ's death till he returns. I'm so grateful for all the ways that the Lord has given us to see the good news about Jesus around us. And he's given us a visual reminder through the Lord's Supper uh, of partaking this so regularly uh, of his sacrifice on our behalf. And when we do confess sins, we can be confident he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Um, before we do that, though, the Apostle Paul continues, goes on to say, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in, a, in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person then examine himself and then so eat, the, uh, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Um, so we're going to take a few minutes uh, to examine ourselves. I think our text this morning from Psalm 6 was so helpful in that regard and how Kelly led us through that. Um, Take a few moments to examine your hearts. Confess any ways you've rebelled against God or you've made a good thing in your life into an ultimate thing where only he should be on the throne um, or any sin in your heart. Um, if you need to confess it uh, with emotion, if you need to reflect on the circumstances of your sin and just plead that before God, you can do that as well. But we're going to take about a minute here with just a little music to just reflect and confess any sin we might need to. Let's, let's stand together, if you would, and take the little wafer out of the, the top, if you haven't already, and again, reflecting on Christ's words when he said, this is my body, which is for you. Um, the great exchange, Jesus' uh, life for ours. Let's remember that by taking of this bread. In this cup, remembering that Jesus gave his life so that we could have life forever. Let's drink together. And just as we proclaim this visually to one another, you're being sent out again this week to proclaim the good news and word or deed to your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your family. Go love others with the same love with which he has loved you. Um, God bless. Love you, church. Have a great Lord's Day. And don't forget, as you leave, we're once again going to be leaving through these exits, looking in this direction. And there's going to be coffee and treats out there. Feel free to stick around. Say hello to one another. Greet one another in the Lord. It's a great day to be with him. God bless you guys. Have a great Lord's Day. Have a blessed week. No, we're, we're not doing that this week. No, it wasn't on the board.